Hello, this is your host, Todd Lewis, to the Praise of Folly podcast. Today is episode one of Bertrand Russell's The Scientific Outlook, the first of our four series of books on the technocratic dictatorship written from the 1930s to the 1950s. All right, so we begin. Prefatory note to the second edition. In this edition, I have made no important changes, but have corrected topical allusions which have become out of date. The material of the last few chapters may seem now more familiar than at the time of the first edition. Since it has been popularized in two widely read books, Huxley's Brave New World and Burnham's Managerial Revolution. I do not suggest that my book had any influence on either of these, but the parallels are interesting and will, I hope, persuade the reader that my fears are more than an individual fantasy. Right. Introduction. To say that we live in an age of science is commonplace, but like most commonplaces, it is only partially true. From this point of view of our predecessors, if they could view our society, we should no doubt appear to be very scientific. But from the point of view of our successors, it is probable that the exact opposite would seem to be the case. Science as a factor in human life is exceedingly recent. Art was already well developed before the last glacial epoch, as we know from the admirable pictures and caves. Of the antiquity of religion, we cannot speak with equal confidence, but it is highly probable that it is coeval with art. At a guess, one might suppose that both have existed for some 80,000 years. Science as an important force begins with Galileo and has therefore existed for some 300 years. During the first half of that short period, it remained in pursuit of the learned, which did not affect the thoughts of, or habits of ordinary men. It is only during the last 150 years that science has become an important factor in determining the everyday life of everyday people. In that short time, it has caused greater changes than has occurred since the days of the ancient Egyptians. 150 years of science have proved more explosive than 5,000 years of pre-scientific culture. It would be absurd to suppose that the explosive power of science is exhausted or has even reached its maximum. It is far more likely that science will continue for centuries to come to produce more and more rapid changes. One may suppose that a new equilibrium will ultimately be reached, either when so much is known that a lifetime is not sufficient to reach the frontiers of knowledge and therefore further discovery must await some considerable increase of longevity or when men become bored with the new toy, become weary of the strenuous requ strenuousness required in the making of scientific advances and become content to enjoy the fruits of their former labors as the late Romans enjoyed the aqueducts built by their predecessors. Or again, it may prove that no scientific society is capable of stability and that a revision of barbarism is a necessary condition of the continuance of human life. Such speculations, however, though they may amuse an idle moment, are too nebulous to have any practical importance. What is important at the present time is that the influence of science upon our thoughts, our hopes, and our habits is continually increasing and likely to increase for several centuries at least. Science, as, it names, as its name implies, is primarily knowledge. By convention, it is knowledge of certain kind, the kind, namely, which seeks general laws connecting a number of particular facts. Gradually, however, the aspect of science as knowledge is being thrust into the background by the aspect of science as the power of manipulating nature. It is because science gives us the power of manipulating nature that it is of more social importance than art. Science as the pursuit of truth is the equal but not the superior of art. Science as a technique, though it may, not, may have little intrinsic value, has a practical importance to which art cannot aspire. Science as a technique has further consequence of which the implications are not yet fully evident. Namely, that it makes possible and even necessary new forms of human society. It has already profoundly modified the forms of economic organizations and functions of states. It is beginning to modify family life, and it is almost certain to do so to a much greater extent in the not too very distant future. In considering the effect of science upon human life, we have therefore the three more or less separate matters to examine. The first is the nature and scope of scientific knowledge. The second, the increased power of manipulation derived from scientific technique. And the third, the changes in social life and in traditional institutions which must result from the new forms of organization that scientific knowledge demands. Science as knowledge, of course, underlies the other two since all the effects which science produces are the outcome of the knowledge which it provides. Man hitherto has been prevented from realizing his hopes by ignorance as demeans. 
As this ignorance disappears, he becomes increasingly able to mold his physical environment, his social milieu, and himself into the forms which he deems best. Insofar as he is wise, this new power is beneficent. Insofar as he is foolish, it is quite the reverse. If, therefore, a scientific civilization is to be a good civilization, it is necessary that increase in knowledge should be accompanied by increase in wisdom. I mean by wisdom, a right conception of the ends of life. This is something which science in itself does not provide. Increase of science by itself, therefore, is not enough to guarantee any genuine progress, though it provides one of the ingredients which progress requires. In the following pages, we shall be concerned with science rather than with wisdom. It is well to remember, however, that this preoccupation is one-sided and needs to be corrected if a balanced view of human life is to be achieved. Chapter 1, Examples of Scientific Method. 1, Galileo. Scientific method, although in its more refined forms, it may seem complicated, is in essential remarkably simple. It consists in observing such facts as will enable the observer to discover general laws governing the facts of the kind in question. The two stages, first of observation and second of inference to a law, are both essential, and each is susceptible of almost indefinite refinement. But in the essence, the first man who said fire burns was employing scientific method at any rate if he had allowed himself to be burnt several times. This man had already possessed, had already passed through the two stages of observation and generalization. He had not, however, what scientific technique demands, a careful choice of significant facts on the one hand, and on the other hand, various means of arriving at laws otherwise than by mere generalization. The man who says unsupported bodies fall in air has merely generalized and is liable to be refuted by balloons, butterflies, and airplanes. Whereas the man who understands the theory of falling bodies knows why certain exceptional bodies do not fall. Scientific method, simple as it is in essence, has been acquired only with great difficulty and is still employed only by a minority who themselves can find its employment to a minority of the questions upon which they have questions. If you number among your acquaintances some eminent man of science accustomed to the minutest quantitative precision in his experiments and the most obtruse skill in his interference from them, you will be able to make him the subject of a little experiment, which is likely to be by no means unilluminating. If you tackle him on party politics, theology, income tax, house agents, the bumptiousness of the working classes, and other topics of a like nature, you are pretty sure before long to provoke an explosion. And to hear him expressing wholly untested opinions with a dogmatism which he would never display in regard to the well-founded results of his laboratory experiments. As this illustration shows, the scientific attitude is in some degree unnatural to man, the majority of our opinions are wish fulfillments, like dreams in the Freudian theory. The mind of the most rational among us may be compared to a stormy sea of passionate convictions based upon desire, upon which float perilously a few tiny boats carrying a cargo of scientifically tested beliefs. Nor is this to be altogether deplored. Life has to be lived, and there is no longer and there is no time to test rationality, all, all beliefs by which our conduct is regulated. Without a certain wholesome rashness, no one could long survive. Scientific method, therefore, must in its very nature be confined to the more solemn and official of our opinions. A medical man who gives advice on diet should give it after full consideration of all that science has to say on the matter. But the man who follows his advice cannot stop to verify it and is obliged to rely, therefore, not upon science, but upon his belief that his medical advisor is scientific. A community impregnated with science is one in which the recognized experts have arrived at their opinions by scientific methods. But it is impossible for the ordinary citizen to repeat the work of the experts for himself. There is in the modern world a great body of well-attested knowledge of all kinds of subjects which the ordinary man accepts on authority without any need for hesitation. But as soon as any strong passion intervenes to warp the expert's judgment, he becomes unreliable. Whatever scientific equipment he may possess... The views of a medical man on pregnancy, childbirth, and lactation were until fairly recently impregnated with sadism. It required, for example, more evidence to persuade them that the anesthetics may be used in childbirth than it would have required to persuade them of the opposite. Anyone, desire, anyone who desires an hour's amusement may be advised to look up the terrigiversations of eminent craniologists in their attempts to prove from brain measurements that women are stupider than men. It is, however, not the lapses of scientific men that concern us when we are trying to describe scientific method. 
The scientific opinion is one which there is some reason to believe true, and unscientific opinion is one in which is held for some reason other than its probable truth. Our age is distinguished from all ages before the 17th century by the fact that some of our opinions are scientific in the above sense. I expect bare matters of fact, since general generality in a greater or less degree is an essential characteristic of science. And since men, with the exception of a few mystics, have never been able to wholly deny the obvious facts of their everyday existence. The Greeks, eminent as they were in almost every department of human activity, did surprisingly little for the creation of science. The great intellectual achievement of the Greeks was geometry, which they believed to be an a priori study, proceeding from self-evident premises and not requiring experimental verification. The Greek genius was deductive rather than inductive, and was therefore at home in mathematics. In the ages that followed, Greek mathematics were nearly forgotten while other products of the Greek passion for deduction survived and flourished, notably theology and law. The Greeks observed the world as poets rather than as men of science, partly, I think because all manual activity was ungentlemanly, so that any study which required experiment seemed a little vulgar. Perhaps it would be fanciful to connect with this the prejudice the fact that the depart department in which the Greeks were most scientific was astronomy, which deals with bodies that can only be seen and not touched. However that may be, it is certainly remarkable how much the Greeks discovered in astronomy. The early decided that the Earth is round, and some of them arrived at the Copernican theory that it is the Earth's rotation and not the revolution of the heavens that causes the apparent diurnal motion of the sun and stars. Archimedes, writing to King Galon of Syracuse, says, Aristarchus of Samos, brought out a book consisting of some hypotheses of which the premises lead to the conclusion that the universe is many times greater than that now so-called. His hypotheses are that the fixed stars and the sun remain unmoved, that the earth revolves around the sun and the circumference of a circle, the sun lying in the center of the orbit. Thus, the Greeks discovered not only the diurnal rotation of the earth, but also its annual revolution about the sun. It was the discovery that a Greek held this opinion which gave Copernicus courage to revive it. In the days of the Renaissance, when Copernicus lived, it was held that any opinion which had been entertained by an ancient might be true, but an opinion which no ancient had entertained could not deserve respect. I doubt whether Copernicus would have become a Copernican, but for Aristarchus, whose opinion had been forgotten until the revival of classical learning. The Greeks also discovered perfectly valid methods of measuring the circumference of the earth. Aristosthenes, the geographer, estimated it 250,000 stadia at about 24,662 miles which is by no means far from the truth. The most scientific of the Greeks was Archimedes, 257 to 212 BC. Like Leonardo da Vinci in a later period, he recommended himself to a prince on the ground of his skill in the art of war. And like Leonardo, he was granted permission to add to human knowledge on condition that he subtracted from human life. His activities in this respect were however more distinguished than those of Leonardo, since he invented the most amazing mechanical contrivances for defending the city of Syracuse against the Romans and was finally killed by a Roman soldier when the city was captured. He is said to have been so absorbed in a mathematical problem that he did not notice the Romans coming. Plutarch is very apologetic on the subject of the mechanical innovations of Archimedes, which he feels to have been hardly worthy of a gentleman, but he considers him excusable on the ground that he was helping his cousin the king in a time of dire peril. Archimedes showed great genius in mathematics and extraordinary skill in the innovation of mechanical contrivances. But its contributions to science, remarkable as they are, still display the deductive attitude of the Greeks, which made the experimental method scarcely possible for him. His work on statistics is famous, and justly so, but it proceeds from axioms like Luke Euclid's geometry, and the axioms are supposed to be self-evident, not the result of experiment. His book on floating bodies is the one which, according to tradition, resulted from the problem of King Hero's crown, which was suspected of being not made of true gold. This problem, as everyone knows, Archimedes is supposed to have solved while in his bath. At any rate, the method which he proposes in his book for such cases is a perfectly valid one, and although the book proceeds from postulates by a method of deduction, one cannot but suppose that he arrived at the postulates experimentally. This is, perhaps, the most nearly scientific in the modern sense of the works of Archimedes. Soon after his time, however, such feeling as the Greeks had for the scientific investigation of natural phenomena decayed and through pure mathematics continued to flourish down to the capture of Alexandria by the Mohammedans. There were hardly any further advances in natural science and the best that had been done, such as the theory of Aristarchus, was forgotten. The Arabs were more experimental than the Greeks, especially in chemistry. They hoped to transmute base metals into gold to discover the philosopher's stone and concoct the elixir of life. Partly on this account, chemical 
investigations were viewed with favor. Throughout the Dark Ages, it was mainly by the Arabs that the tradition of civilization was carried on, and it was largely from them that Christians such as Roger Bacon acquired whatever scientific knowledge the later Middle Ages possessed. The Arabs, however, had a defect which was the opposite of that of the Greeks. They sought detached facts rather than general principles, and had not the power of inferring general laws from the facts which they discovered. In Europe, when the scholastic system first began to give way before the Renaissance, there came to be, for a time, a dislike of all generalizations and all systems. Montaigne illustrates this tendency. He likes queer facts, particularly if they disprove something. He has no desire to make his op opinion systematic and coherent. Rabelais, also with his motto, Fias que, que fedoras, is as adverse from intellectual as from other fetters. The Renaissance rejoiced in the recovered liberty of speculation and was not anxious to lose this liberty even in the interest of truth. Of the typical figures of the Renaissance, far the most scientific was Leonardo, whose notebooks are fascinating and contain many brilliant anticipations of later discoveries, but he brought almost nothing to fruition and remained without effect upon his scientific successors. Scientific method, as we understand it, came into the world full-fledged with Galileo, 1564-1642, and to a somewhat lesser degree in his contemporary Kepler, 1571-1630. Kepler is known to frame through his three laws. He first discovered that the planets move around the sun in ellipses, not in circles. To the modern mind, there is nothing astonishing in the fact that the Earth's orbit is an ellipse. But to minds trained in antiquity, anything except a circle or some contemplation of circles seemed almost incredible for a heavenly body. To the Greeks, the planets were divine and must therefore move in perfect curves. Circles and epicycles did not offend their aesthetic susceptibilities, but a crooked, skewed orbit such as the Earth actually is would have shocked them deeply. Unprejudiced observation without regard to aesthetic prejudices required, therefore, at the time, a rare intensity of scientific ardor. It was Kepler and Galileo who established the fact that the Earth and the other planets go around the sun. This had been observed by Copernicus and, as we have seen, by certain Greeks, but they had not succeeded in giving proofs. Copernicus, indeed, had no serious arguments to advance in favor of his view. It would be doing Kepler more than justice to suggest that in adopting the Copernican hypothesis, he was acting on purely scientific motives. It appears that at any rate in youth, he was addicted to sun worship and thought the center of the universe the only place worthy of so great a deity. None but scientific motives, however, could have led him to, dis to the discovery that the planetary orbits are ellipses and not circles. He and still more Galileo possessed... The scientific method in its completeness, while much more is known than was known in their day, nothing essential has been added to, to the method. They proceeded from observation of particular facts to the establishment of exact quantitative laws by means of which future particular facts could be predicated. They shocked their contemporaries profoundly, partly because their conclusions were inherently shocking to the beliefs of that age, but partly also because the belief in authority had enabled learned men to confine their researches to libraries. And the professors were pained at the suggestion that it might be necessary to look at the world in order to know what it is like. Galileo, it must be confessed, confessed was something of a gammon. When still very young, he became professor of mathematics at Pisa, but as the salary was only seven and a half D a day, he does not seem to have thought that a very dignified bearing could be expected of him. He began by writing a treatise against the wearing of a cap and gown in the university, which may perhaps have been popular with undergraduates, but was viewed with grave disfavor by his fellow professors. He would amuse himself by arranging occasions which would make his colleagues look silly. They asserted, for example, on the basis of Aristotle's physics that a body weighing 10 pounds would fall through a given distance of one-tenth of the time that would have taken by body weight one pound, weighing one pound. So he went up on the top of the leaning tower of Pisa one morning with a 10-pound shot and a one-pound shot, and just as the professors were proceeding with leisurely dignity to their respective lecture rooms and the presence of their pupils, he attracted their attention and dropped the two weights from the top of the tower to their feet. The two weights arrived protect, protect, ugh, practically simultaneously. The professors, however, maintained that their eyes must have deceived them since it was impossible that Aristotle could be an error. On another occasion, he was even more rash. Giovanni de' Medici, who was the governor of Leghorn, invented a dredging machine of which she was very proud. Galileo pointed out that whatever else it might do, it would not dredge, which proved to be a fact. This caused Giovanni to become an ardent Aristotelian. Galileo became unpopular and was hissed at his lectures, a fate which also befell Einstein in Berlin. Then he made a telescope and invent, 
invited the professors to look through it at Jupiter's moons. They were fused on the ground that Aristotle had not mentioned these satellites, and therefore anybody who thought he saw them must be mistaken. The experiment from the Lean Tower of Pisa illustrated Galileo's first important piece of work, namely the establishment of the law of falling bodies, according to which all bodies fall at the same rate in a vacuum, and at the end of a given time have a velocity proportional to the time in which they have been falling and have traversed a distance proportional to the square of that time. Aristotle had maintained otherwise, but neither he nor any of his successors throughout nearly 2,000 years had since had taken the trouble to find out whether what he said was true. The idea of doing so was a novelty, and Galileo's disrespect for authority was considered abominable. He had, of course, many friends, men to whom the spectacle of intelligence was delightful in itself. Few such men, however, held academic posts, and university opinion was bitterly hostile to his discoveries. As everyone knows, he came in conflict with the Inquisition at the end of his life for maintaining that the earth goes around the sun. He had had a previous minor encounter from which he had emerged without great damage, but in the year 1632, he published a book of dialogues on the Copernican and Ptolemaic systems in which he had the temerity to place some remarks that had been made by the Pope into the mouth of a character named Simplicius. The Pope had hitherto been friendly to him, but at this point became furious. Galileo was living at Florence on terms of friendship with the Grand Duke, but the Inquisition sent for him to come to Rome to be tried and threatened the Grand Duke with pains and penalties if he continued to shelter Galileo. Galileo was at this time 70 years old, very ill, and going blind. He sent a medical certificate to the effect that he was not fit to travel, so the Inquisition sent a doctor of their own with orders that as soon as he was well enough, he should be brought in chains. Upon hearing that this order was on its way, he set out voluntarily. By means of threats, he was induced to make submission. The sentence of the Inquisition is an interesting document. Whereas you, Galileo, son of the late Vincenzo Galilei of Florence, age 70 years old, were denounced in 1615 to his holy office for holding as true a false doctrine taught by many, namely that the sun is immovable in the center of the world, and that the earth moves, and also with the diurnal motion, also having pupils whom you instructed in the same opinions. Also for maintaining a correspondence of the same with some German mathematicians, also for publishing certain letters on the sunspots, in which you developed the same doctrine as true. Also for answering the objections which were continually placed produced from the Holy Scriptures by glossing the said scriptures according to your own meaning, and was thereupon was produced the copy of a writing in the form of a letter professedly written by you to a person formerly your pupil, in which following the hypothesis of Copernicus, you include several proportions, propositions contrary to the true sense and authority of the Holy Scriptures. Therefore, this holy tribunal being desirous for providing against the disorder or mischief which were thence proceeding and increasing to the detriment of the holy faith by the desire of his holiness and of the most eminent lord cardinals of the supreme and universal inquisition. The two propositions of the stability of the sun and the motion of the earth were qualified by the theological qualifiers as follows. One, the proposition that the sun is the center of the world and immovable from its place is absurd, philosophically false, and formally heretical because it is expressly contrary to holy scriptures. Two, the proposition that the earth is not the center of the world, nor immovable, but that it moves, and also with the diurnal action is also absurd, philosophically false, and theologically considered at least erroneous in faith. But whereas being pleased at that time to deal mildly with you, it was decreed in the Holy Congregation, held before this ho His Holiness on the 25th day of February, 1616, that his eminence and the Lord Cardinal Bellarmine should enjoin you to give up altogether this said false doctrine. And if you should refuse, that you should be ordered by the commissary of the Holy Office to relinquish it, not to teach it to others, nor to defend it, and in default of acquiescence, that you should be imprisoned. And whereas in execution of this degree on the following day at the palace in the presence of the eminence, the Lord, the said Lord Cardinal Bellarmine, after you have been mildly admonished by the said Lord Cardinal, you were commanded by the commissary of the Holy Office before a notary and a witness to relinquish altogether the said false opinion and in future neither to defend nor teach it in any manner, neither verbally nor in writing, and upon your promising obedience you were dismissed. And in order that so pernicious a doctrine might be altogether rooted out, not insinuate itself further to the heavy detriment of the Catholic Church, a decree emanated from the Holy Congregation of the Index prohibiting the books which treat of this doctrine, declaring it false, and although contrary to the holy and divine scripture. And whereas a book has since appeared published at Florence last year, 
the title of which showed that you were the author, which is titled The Dialogue of Galileo Galilei on the Two Principal Systems of the World, the Ptolemaic and Copernican. And whereas the Holy Congregation has heard that in consequence of printing the said book, the false opinion of the Earth's motion and stability of the sun is daily gaining ground, the said book has been taken into careful consideration, and in it has been detected a glaring violation of the said order, which has been intimated to you, inasmuch as in this book you have defended the said opinion already, and in your presence con condemned, although in the same book you labor with many circumlocations to introduce, induce the belief that it is left undecided and merely probable, which is equally a very grave error, since an opinion can in no way be probable which has already been declared and finally determined contrary to the divine scripture. Therefore, by our order, you have been cited to, this, to his holy office, where on your examination upon oath you have been acknowledged the said book is written and printed by you. You also confess that you began to write the said book 10 or 12 years ago after the order aforesaid had been given. Also that you had demanded license to publish it without signifying to those who granted you this permission that you had been commanded not to hold, defend, or teach the said doctrine in any manner. You also confess that the reader might think the arguments abducted on the false side to be so worded as more effectually to compel conviction than to easily to be easily refutable, alleging an excuse that you had thus run into an error, foreign as you say, to your intention, from writing in the form of dialogue, and in consequence of the natural complacency which everyone feels with regard to his own sub subtleties, and in showing himself more skillful than the generality of mankind, and contriving even in favor of false propositions, ingenious and plausible arguments. And, a, and upon a conven, convenient time being given you for making your defense, you produce a certificate in the handwriting of his eminence, the Lord Cardinal Bellarmine, procured, as you said, by yourself, that you might defend yourself against the calumnies of your enemies who reported that you had abjured your opinions and had been punished by the Holy Office, in which certificate it is declared that you had not abjured nor had been punished, but merely that the declaration made by His Holiness and promulgated by the Holy Congregation of the Index had been announced to you, which declares that the opinion of the motion of the earth and stability of the sun is contrary to the Holy Scriptures and therefore cannot be held or defended. Wherefore, since no mention is made of two articles of the order to wit, the order not to teach, and in any manner you argue that you ought to believe that in the lapse of 14 or 16 years they had escaped your memory, and that this was the reason you were silent as to the order when you were sought permission to publish your book, and that this is said by you not to excuse your error, but that it may be attributed to vain, glorious ambition rather than to malice. But this very certificate produced on your behalf has greatly aggravated your offense, since it is therein declared that the said opinion is contrary to the Holy Scriptures, and yet you have dared to treat of it and to argue that it is probable. Nor is there any extenuation in the license artfully and cunningly extorted by you, since you did not intimate the command imposed upon you. But whereas it appeared to us that you had not disclosed the whole truth with regard to your intention, we thought it necessary to proceed to a rigorous examination of you, in which without any prejudice to which you had confessed, and which is about detailed against you with, with regard to your said intention, you answered like a good Catholic. Therefore, having seen and maturely considered the merits of your case with your said confession and excuses and everything else which ought to be seen and considered, we have come to the underwritten final sentence against you. In invoking, therefore, the most holy name of our Lord Jesus Christ and his most glorious Virgin Mother Mary, we pronounce this our final sentence, which sitting in council and judgment with the reverend masters of sacred theology and doctors of both laws, our assessors, we put forth in this writing in regard to the matters and controversies between the magnificent Carlo Sincurio, doctor of both laws, fiscal advisor of the Holy Office of the part, and you, Galileo Galilee, defendant, tried and confesses above. Of the other part, we pronounce judge and declare that you said the, la the said Galileo by reason of these things, which have been detailed in the course of this writing in which is above you have confessed, have rendered yourself vehemently suspected by this Holy Office of heresy that is, of having believed and held the doctrine which is false and contrary to the holy and divine scriptures, that the sun is the center of the world and that it does not move from east to west, and that the earth does move and it is not the center of the world. Also, that an opinion can be held and supported and probable after it has been declared and finally decreed contrary to the holy scripture. And consequently, that you have incurred all the censures and penalties enjoined and promulgated in the sacred canons and other general 
in particular constitutions against delinquents of this description. From which it is our pleasure that you be absolved, provided that with a sincere heart and unfeigned faith in our presence, you abjure, curse, and detest the said errors and heresies, and every other error and heresy contrary to the Catholic and Apostolic Church of Rome and the form now shown to you. But that your grievous and pernicious error and transgression may not go altogether unpunished, that you may be made more cautious in the future, and may be a warning to others to abstain from delinquencies of the source. We decree that the book Dialogues of Galileo Galilee be prohibited by a public edict, and we condemn you to the formal prison of this holy office for a period detainable, determinable at our pleasure and by way of salutary penance. We order you during the next three years to recite once a week the seven penitential psalms, reserving to ourselves the power of moderating, commuting, or taking off the whole or part of the said punishment or penance. The formula of abjuration, which is a consequence of the sentence Galileo was compelled to pronounce, was as follows. I, Galileo Galilee, saw in the late... Vincenzo Galilee of Florence, age 70 years, being brought personally to judgment and kneeling before you, most eminent and most reverend lords, cardinals, general inquisitors of the Universal Christian Republic, against hereditary depravity, having been having before my eyes the Holy Gospels, which I touch with my own hands, swear that I have always believed, and with the help of God, will in future believe every article which the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church of Rome holds, teaches, and preaches. But because I have been enjoined by this holy office, altogether to abandon the false opinion which maintains that the sun is the center and immovable, forbidden to hold, defend, or teach the said false doctrine in any manner, and because after it has been signified to me that the said doctrine is repugnant to the Holy Scripture, I have written and printed a, a book in which I treat the same condemned doctrine and adduce reasons with great force in support of the same without giving any solution. And therefore, I have been judged grievously suspected of heresy, that is to say that I held and believed that the sun is the center of the world immovable and that the earth is not the center and movable. I am willing to remove from the minds of your eminences and of every Catholic Christian this vehement suspicion rightly entertained forward towards me, therefore with sincere heart and unfeigned faith. I abjure, curse, and detest the said errors and heresies, and generally every other error and sect contrary to the said holy church. I swear that I will never more in future say or assert anything verbally or in writing which may give rise to a similar suspicion of me, but that if I shall know any heretic or any suspect, anyone suspected of heresy, I will denounce him to this holy office or to the inquisitor and ordinary of the place in which I may be. I swear moreover and promise that I will fulfill and observe fully all the penances which have been or shall be laid on me by his holy office. But if it shall happen that I violate any of my said promises, oaths, and protestations, which God avert, I subject myself to all the pains and punishments which, which have been decreed and promulgated by the sacred canons and other general and particular constitutions against delinquents of this description. So may God help me in his holy gospels, which I touch with my own hands. I, the above-named Galileo Galilee, have adjured, sworn, promised, and bound myself as above, and a witness thereof with my own hand I have subscribed this present writing of my abjuration, which I have received word for word at Rome in the convent of Minerva, June the 22nd, 1633. I, Galileo Galilee, have abjured as above with my own hand. It is not true that after reciting this abjuration, he muttered, et pour si move. It was the world that said this, not Galileo. The Inquisition stated that Galileo's fate should be a warning to others to abstain from delinquencies of the source, and this they were successful, so far at least as Italy was concerned. Galileo was the last of the great Italians. No Italian since his day has been capable of delinquencies of his sort. It cannot be said that Gal the church has altered greatly since the time of Galileo. Wherever it, has a, wherever it has power, as in Ireland and Boston, it still forbids all literature containing new ideas. The conflict between Galileo and the Inquisition is not merely the conflict between free thought and bigotry or between science and religion. It is a conflict between the spirit of induction and the spirit of deduction. Those who believe in deduction as the method of arriving at knowledge are compelled to find their premises somewhere, usually in a sacred book. Deduction from inspired books is the method of arriving at truth employed by jurists, Christians, Mohammedans, and communists. Since deduction as a means of obtaining knowledge collapses when doubt is thrown upon its premises, those who believe in deduction must certainly be bitter against men who question the authority of the sacred books. Galileo questioned both Aristotle and scriptures, and therefore destroyed the whole edifice of medieval knowledge. His predecessors had known how the world was created and what was man's destiny 
the deepest mysteries of metaphysics and the hidden principles governing the behavior of bodies. Throughout the moral and material universe, nothing was mysterious to them, nothing hidden, nothing incapable of exposition and orderly syllogisms compared with all of this wealth. What was left of the followers of Galileo? A law of falling bodies, a theory of the pendulum and Kepler's ellipses. Can it be wondered at that the learned cried out at such a destruction of their hard-won wealth? As the rising sun scatters the multitude of stars, so Galileo's few proved truths banish the scintillating firmament of medieval certainties. Socrates had said that he was wiser than his contemporaries because he alone knew that he knew nothing. This was a rhetorical device. Galileo could have said with truth that he knew something, but knew he knew little. Well, his Aristotelian contemporaries knew nothing, but they thought they knew much. Knowledge, as opposed to fantasies of wish fulfillment, is difficult to come by. A little contact with real knowledge makes fantasies less acceptable. As a matter of fact, knowledge is even harder to come by than Galileo supposed. And much that he believed was only approximate, but in the process of acquiring knowledge, it once secure in general, Galileo took the first great step. He is therefore the father of modern times. Whatever we may like or dislike about the age in which we live, its increase of population, its improvement in health, its trains, motor cars, radio politics, and advertisements of soap all emanate from Galileo. If the Inquisition could have caught him young, we might not now we might not now be enjoying the blessings of air warfare and atomic bombs, nor on the other hand, the diminution of poverty and disease, which is characteristic of our age. It is customary among a certain school of sociologists to minimize the importance of intelligence and to attribute all great events to large and personal causes. I believe this to be an entire delusion. I believe that of a hundred of the men of the 17th century who had been killed in infancy, the modern world would not exist. And of these hundred, Galileo is chief. Two, Newton. Sir Isaac Newton was born in the year in which Galileo died, 1642. Like Galileo, he lived to be very to be a very old man. He as he died in the year 1727. In the short period between these two men's activities, the position of science in the world was completely changed. Galileo, all his life, had to fight against the recognized men of learning, and in his last years had to suffer persecutions and condemnation of his work. Newton, on the other hand, from the moment when at the age of 18 he became an undergraduate at Trinity College. Cambridge received universal applause. Less than two years after he had taken the MA degree, the masters of his college was describing him as a man of incredible genius. He was acclaimed by the whole learned world. He was honored by monarchs and the true English spirit was rewarded for his work by a government post in which it could not be continued. So important was he that when George I ascended to the throne, the great Leibniz had to be left behind at Hanover because he and Newton had quarreled. It is fortunate for succeeding ages that Newton's circumstances were so placid. He was a timorous, nervous man, at once quarrelsome and afraid of controversy. He hated publication because it exposed him to criticism and had to be bullied into publishing by kind friends apropos of his optics. He wrote to Leibniz, I was so persecuted with discussions arising from the publication of my theory of light that I blamed my own imprudence for parting with so substantial a blessing as my quiet to run after a shadow. If he had encountered the sort of opposition with which Galileo had to contend, it is probable he would never have published a line. Newton's truth, triumph, was the most spectacular in the history of science. Astronomy since the time of the Greeks had been seen at once the most advanced and the most respected of the sciences. Kepler's laws were still fairly recent, and the third of them was by no means universally accepted. Moreover, there appeared strange and unaccountable to those who had been accustomed to circles and up cycles. Galileo's theory of the tide were not, was not wrong, the motion of the moon was not properly understood, and astronomers could not but feel the loss of that epic unity that the heavens possess in the Ptolemaic system. Newton, at one stroke, by his law of gravitation, brought order and unity into this confusion. Not only the major aspects of the motion of the planets and satellites were accounted for, but also all the nice cities at that time known, even the comets, which not so long ago had blazed forth the, de the death of princes, were found to proceed according to the law of gravitation. Halley's Comet was one of the most obliging among them, and Halley was Newton's best friend. Newton's Principia proceeds in the Grand Greek manner from the three laws of motion and the law of gravitation. By purely mathematical deduction, the whole solar system is explained. Newton's work is statuesque and Hellenic, unlike the best work of our own time. The nearest approach to the same classical perfection among moderns in the theory of is the theory of relativity, but even that does not aim at the same finality since the rate of progress nowadays is too great. 
Everyone knows the story of the fall of the apple. Unlike most of such stories, it is not certainly it is not certainly known to be false. At any rate, it was in the year 1665 that Newton first thought of the law of gravitation, and in that year, on account of the Great Plague, he spent his time in the country, possibly in an orchard. He did not publish his Principia until the year 1687. For 21 years, he was content to think over his theory and gradually perfect it. No modern would dare to do such a thing since 21 years is enough to change completely the scientific landscape. Even Einstein's work has always contained ragged edges, unresolved doubts, and unfinished speculations. I do not say this as a criticism. I say it only to illustrate the difference between our age and that of Newton. We aim no longer at perfection because of the army of successors who can scarcely outstrip and who are at every moment ready to obliterate our traces. The universal respect accorded to Newton as contrasted with the treatment meted out to Galileo was due in part to Galileo's own work and to that of the other men of science who filled the intervening years, but it was due also and quite as much to the course of politics. In Germany, the Thirty Years' War, which was raging when Galileo died, had the population without achieving the slightest change in the balance of power between Protestants and Catholics. This caused even the least reflective to think that, the proper, that perhaps the wars of religion were a mistake. France, though a Catholic power, had supported the German Protestants in Henry IV, although he had become a Catholic in order to win Paris, was not led by this motive into any great bigotry with regard to his new faith. In England, the Civil War, which began in the year of Newton's birth, led to the rule of the saints, which turned everybody except the saints against religious zeal. Newton entered the university in the year after that, in which Charles II returned from exile. And Charles II, who founded the Royal Society, did all in his power to encourage science, partially, no doubt, as an antidote to bigotry. Protestant bigotry had kept him in exile, while Catholic bigotry caused his brother to lose the throne. Charles II was an intellectual, intelligent monarch, made it a rule of the government to avoid having to set out on his travels again. The period from his ascension to the death of Queen Anne was the most brilliant intellectually in English history. In France, meanwhile, Descartes had inaugurated modern philosophy, but his theory of vortices proved an obstacle to the acceptance of Newton's ideas. It was only after Newton's death, and largely as a result of Voltaire's Letters Philosophiques, that Newton gained vogue, but when he did, his vogue was terrific. In fact, Throughout the following century, down to the fall of Napoleon, it was chiefly the French who carried on Napoleon, Newton's work. The English were misled by patriotism into adhering to his methods, where they were inferior to those of Leibniz, with the result that after his death, English mathematics were negligible for a hundred years. The harm that in Italy was done by bigotry was done in England by nationalism. It would have been hard to say which of the two proved the more pernicious. Though Newton's Principia retains the deductive form, which was inaugurated by the Greeks, its spirit is quite different from that of the Greek work, since the law of gravitation, which is one of its premises, is not supposed to be self-evident, but is arrived at inductively from Kepler's laws. The book, therefore, illustrates scientific method in the form which is its ideal. From observation of particular facts, it arrives by induction in a general law, and by deduction from the general law, other particular facts are inferred. This is still the idea of physics, which is the science from which, in theory, all others ought to be deduced. But the realization of the ideal is somewhat more difficult than it seemed in Newton's day, and premature systemization has been found to be a danger. Newton's law of gravitation has had a particular history, while it continued for over 200 years to explain almost every fact that was known in regard to the motions of the heavenly bodies. It remained itself isolated and mysterious among natural laws. New branches of physics grew to vast proportions. The theories of sound, heat, light, and electricity were successfully explored, but no property of matter was discovered which could be in any way connected with gravitation. It was only through Einstein's general theory of relativity, 1915, that gravitation was fitted into the general scheme of physics. And then it was found to belong rather to geometry than to physics in the old-fashioned sense. From a, from a particular point of view, Einstein's theory involves only very minute corrections of Newton's re Newtonian results. These very minute corrections, so far as they are measurable, have been empirically verified, but while the practical cha change is small, the intellectual change is enormous since our whole conception of space and time has had to be revolutionized. The work of Einstein has emphasized the difficulty of permanent achievement in science. Newton's laws of gravitation had reigned so long and explained so much that it seems scarcely credible that it should stand in need of correction. Nevertheless, such correction has at last proved necessary and no one doubts the correction will, and its turn have to be corrected.
3. Darwin. The earliest triumphs of scientific method were in astronomy, and its most noteworthy triumphs in quite recent times have been in atomic physics. Both these are matters requiring much mathematics for the treatment, perhaps in its ultimate perfection. All science will be mathematical, but in the meantime, there are vast fields of which mathematics is scarcely applicable, and among those are to be found some of the most important achievements of modern science. We may take Darwin's work as, as illustrative of the non-mathematical sciences. Darwin, like Newton, dominated the intellectual outlook of an epoch. Not only among men of science, but among the general educated public, and like Galileo, he came into the conflict with theology, though with le results less disastrous to himself. Darwin's importance in the history of culture is very great, but the value of his work from a strictly scientific point of view is difficult to appraise. He did not invent the hypothesis of evolution, which had occurred to many of his predecessors. He brought a mass of evidence in its favor, and he invented a certain mechanism which he called natural selection to account for it. Much of his evidence remains valid, but natural selection is less in favor amongst biologists than it used to be. He was a man who traveled widely, observed intelligently, and reflected patiently. Few men of his eminence have had less of the quality called brilliance. No one thought much of him in his youth. At Cambridge, he was content to do no work and take a pass degree. Not being able at that time to study biology in the university, he preferred to spend his time walking around the country collecting beetles, which is officially a form of idleness. His real education he owed to the voyage of the Beagle, which gave him the opportunity of studying the flora and fauna of many regions and of observing the habitats of allied but geographically separated species. Some of his best work was concerned with what is now called ecology, i.e. the geographical distribution of species in genera. He observed, for example, that the vegetation of the High Alps resembles that of the polar regions from which he inferred a common ancestry at the time of the glacial epoch. Apart from scientific details, Darwin's importance lies in the fact that he can cause biologists and through them the general public to abandon the former belief in the immutability of species and to accept that the, the view that all different kinds of animals have been developed by variation out of a common ancestry. Like every other innovator of modern times, he had to combat the authority of Aristotle. Aristotle, it should be said, has been one of the greatest misfortunes of the human race. To this day, the teaching of logic in most universities is full of nonsense for which he is responsible. The theory of biologists before Darwin was that there is laid up in heaven an ideal cat and an ideal dog and so on. Then actual cats and dogs are more or less imperfect copies of these celestial types. Each species corresponds to a different idea in the divine mind, and therefore can be there can be no transition from one species to another, since each species results from a separate act of creation. Geological evidence made this view increasingly difficult to maintain, since the ancestors of existing widely, widely separated types were found to resemble each other much more closely than the species of the present day. The horse, for example, once had its proper complement of toes, or the birds were scarcely distinguishable from reptiles, and so on. While the particular mechanism of natural selection is no longer regarded by biologists as adequate, the general fact of evolution is now universally admitted among educated people. In regard to animals other than man, the theory of evolution might have been admitted by some people without too great a struggle. But in the popular mind, Darwinism became identified with the hypothesis that men are descended from monkeys. This was painful to our human conceit, almost as painful as the Copernican doctrine of the earth is not the center of the universe. Traditional theology, as is natural, has always been flattering to the human species. If it had been invented by monkeys or inhabitants of Venus, it would no doubt not have had this quality. As it is, people have always been able to defend their self-esteem under the impression that they were defending religion. Moreover, we know that men have souls, whereas monkeys have none. If men developed gradually out of monkeys, at what moment did they acquire a soul? This problem is not really any worse than the problem as to the particular stage at which the fetus acquires a soul, but new difficulties always seem worse than old ones since the old ones lose their sting by familiarity. If to escape from the difficulty we decide that monkeys have souls, we shall be driven step by step to the view that protozoa have souls. And if we are going to deny protozoa souls, we shall, if we are evolutionists, be almost compelled to deny them to men. All these difficulties were at once apparent to the opponents of Darwin, and it is surprising that the opposition to him was not even more fierce than it was. Darwin's work, even though it may require correction on many points, nevertheless affords an example of what is essential in scientific method, namely the substitution of general laws based on evidence for fairy tales embodying a fantasy of wish fulfillment. Human beings find it difficult in all spheres to base their opinions upon evidence rather than upon their hopes. When their neighbors are accused of lapses from virtue, people find it almost impossible to wait for the accusation to be verified before believing it. When they remark, embark upon a war, both sides believe that they are sure of victory. When a man puts his money on a horse, he feels sure that it will win. When he contemplates himself, he is convinced that he is a fine fellow who has an immortal soul. 
The objective evidence for each and all of these propositions may be of the slightest, but our wishes produce an almost irresistible tendency to believe. Scientific method sweeps aside our wishes and endeavors to arrive at opinions in which wishes play no part. There are, of course, practical advantages in the scientific method. If this were not so, it would n never have been able to make way against the world of fantasy. The bookmaker is scientific and grows rich, whereas the ordinary better is unscientific and grows poor. And so in regard to human excellence, the belief that men have souls has produced a certain technique for the purpose of improving mankind, which in spite of prolonged and expensive effort has hitherto had no visible good result. The scientific study of life and of the human body and mind of a contrary is likely before very long to give us the power of producing improvements beyond our previous dreams and the health, intelligence, and virtue of the average human beings. Darwin was mistaken as to the laws of heredity, which had been completely transformed by the Mendelian theory. He, he had also no theory as to the origin of variations, and he believed them to be so much smaller and more gradual than they have been found to be in certain circumstances. On these points, modern biologists have advanced far beyond him, but they would not have reached the point at which they are but for the impetus given by his work. And the massiveness of his researches was necessary in order to impress men with the importance and inevitability of the theory of evolution. All right, now we shall stop. That is all we have for tonight. We will pick up again next week with Pavlov. Uh, let's see. Oswald Spengler, the most underrated of Russell's works. Yes. GF, hello. Hashima Wan, don't, you don't read the comments in the chat anymore? Well, not while I'm reading the text. GF, one, the things we benefit, one, the things we benefited thanks to the Enlightenment was getting rid of Octoritas things. We were wrong because Aristotle was right and he said he is right, so you were wrong despite what can be said about free thinking. All right, everyone. I'll see you next week. This is Todd Lewis of the Praise of Fly podcast signing off.